Hello, and thank you very much for joining this panel of the World Economic uh, Forum on the future of the international trading system. Well, the international trading system over the many decades since World War II has delivered unprecedented prosperity and growth to many of the world's nations. And yet, in the last few years, it has uh, sustained shock after shock. Uh, we've had uh, Br uh, Britain's exit from the European Union. You we've had the World Trade Organization paralyzed by disputes centered on its largest member, the United States. And more broadly, the world has seen a significant pullback from globalization. And the origins of this backlash are multifaceted. Some of it reflects unhappiness with the inequality that's been fostered by uh, free movement of goods, services, and people. Some of it relate, reflects newfound appreciation or uh, value placed on sovereignty and borders and discomfort with vast movements of people. And then in the last year, we've had the pandemic, which of course led to higher um, uh, borders closing to people, restrictions on exports of important medical uh, goods, and more recently, vaccine nationalism. The challenge facing the world right now is how do you re how do you retrieve and restore the great things about the international trade system while also taking appropriate response to some of these concerns that have led to that have fueled the backlash in uh, recent months? We're joined today by several excellent uh, panelists to discuss this topic with me. Uh, Secretary of State of Trade of the United Kingdom, Elizabeth Truss, um, uh, CEO and Chairman of the Executive Board of Germany's Merck Company. Uh, Stefan Oshman. We hopefully will be joined soon by uh, the Netherlands Minister of Trade, Sigrid Koch. Uh, regrettably, uh, Paulo Guedes, the Minister of the Economy of Brazil, had to cancel and will not be joining us. Uh, Secretary Truss, let me start with you. Britain is now on its own. It's left the European Union. Um, a, a healthy and vigorous World Trade Organization is more important than ever to the UK. What, in your view, are the priorities for reforming the WTO, especially given the challenges it faced under the previous U.S. Uh, administration? Well, the fact is that the global trading system has been troubled for some time. And particularly as we are seeking to recover from the coronavirus, it's vitally important that we resist protectionism, but we promote free and fair trade at the same time. And the United Kingdom is keen to work with other countries who share the same approach and share the support for the rules-based international trading system. And President Biden has uh, today come out with a statement of support for WTA reform. Uh, he's indicated a desire to uh, work multilaterally to deal with some of these issues. And I think the United Kingdom has a big opportunity this year. First of all, because we are now uh, an independent trading nation with a independent seat at the World Trade Organization, we also got the presidency of the G7, uh, where one of our priorities is promoting free and fair trade. And we're also the president of COP. And of course, environmental trade is a very important issue for the United Kingdom. So we want to uh, show by example what we're doing. So the new UK global tariff is lower, greener and simpler uh, than its forebears. Uh, we have struck uh, continuity agreements covering 63 countries plus secured a deal with the EU. Uh, that means that 64% of the UK's trade is now covered by preferential trade agreements. And we're also working towards accession of the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. But alongside those bilateral and plurilateral arrangements, the UK does want to see uh, world trade organisation reform. So what does that mean? First of all, it means sorting out the appointment of the new Director General. Uh, it means dealing with some of the long unresolved issues at the WTO, the dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, for example, we need to get resolved. Big countries, small countries need to understand that they're going to be treated fairly under the WTO system and that the rules will be impartially enforced. Uh, we also need to face up to the fact that WTO rules haven't significantly changed since 1995. Uh, and of course, since then, we've had a huge digital revolution. Uh, that revolution has only been uh, accelerated uh, by what we've seen during the pandemic. So the WTO desperately needs new digital rules to operate. 
uh, so that we can catch up uh, with the way trade has changed. And the final point that I want to make is around subsidies and state-owned enterprises, which can undermine genuine free trade. And Greg, you talked about uh, people losing trust uh, on globalization. I think one of the reasons is uh, that people can see things are unfair, uh, that if state-owned enterprises are able to subsidize and be able to undermine uh, free enterprise economies, then that can destroy trust uh, in trade. So we are keen to see, first of all, the rules enforced, a proper transparency around subsidies, but also bringing in new rules where they are needed to tackle these issues. And the United Kingdom is keen to work uh, with those leading in this area, notably Japan, the US and the EU, uh, to see change to that system. I do think that we've got a unique opportunity in 2021. Uh, the ministers of the WTO have now not met for three years. Uh, I hope that the MC12 conference will be in December this year. And I think we've got a real opportunity over the next 12 months to build up a real programme of reform, get support for that, uh, both in the developed and developing world, and reset the global trading system so it works for all of our citizens. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Oshman, I'll turn to you now. I mean, uh, as the head of one of the largest life sciences companies in Europe, um, free trade and inputs and outputs is very important to you. And yet we're seeing the world going in the opposite direction since the arrival of the pandemic with increased um, pressure on countries to restrict the supply of essential medical and pharmaceutical inputs to their own people. Just this week, the European Union indicated that it would ask for notification before finished vaccines are exported. And there are concerns this might actually lead to bag ex export restrictions. What are your thoughts on the risks of these policies and how should we uh, uh, deal with them? Uh, I would say, thank you very much. I would say it actually feels great to be here with leaders who are committed to making our global trading system part of the solution to the pandemic, the current pandemic and potentially uh, future pandemics. Uh, you mentioned the uh, decision by the EU Commission that was actually published today and our sort of unprecedented uh, move to, um, uh, for export controls and what is called transparency. It's, it's based on technical issues in one, uh, in one production site in, in Belgium. It's a, it's, it's, a remarkable, it's a remarkable move. We've seen uh, disruptions uh, in, in, the, uh, in the United States through the Wartimes Act, where actually US companies, because uh, we couldn't supply them, we couldn't export, uh, uh, US companies who would produce abroad could not make vaccine because of these uh, because of these rules that were actually meant to ensure vaccine supply. So Mac, I mean, our company, just to make clear what we're doing, we're a diversified science and technology company. We have three businesses, Biopharma, and we do uh, uh, also research into COVID therapeutics ourselves. Our largest business is our life science tools business. There we are a supplier and a partner to the companies and governments that are developing and manufacturing vaccines, therapeutics, Diagnostics, we supply the materials, the equipment and consumables necessary for the development and for the manufacture, uh, the production of, of such products such as vaccines. And we also share know-how and insights and to help these companies and scientists to do their, uh, uh, to do their uh, work. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, our customers are facing unprecedented pressure and demand has skyrocketed and even as critical inputs are short in supply and investments to expand manufacturing capacity are urgently needed, but this is expensive of course, and it takes time. And governments initially and recently reacted with policy that in quite a few cases were counterproductive. And the pandemic revealed, I think, important weaknesses in global value chains. Not as it is often reported in the, in the media, the question of, globalized supply chains has actually, or that, that was not an issue really, that was something that has actually worked extremely well. It is these protective me measures that have uh, brought about obstacles. And the challenges are clear, 
think we must act to address them so that we can get the vaccines into the arms of as many people as possible and as quickly as possible. And I think leadership by trade officials will be important. And let me explain why uh, very briefly. Our customers, whether they're large or small, whether they're in developed or in developing countries alike, face tariffs of often more than 25% on inputs necessary to make vaccines and diagnostics. And this adds unnecessary cost, it drives up prices, it prevents new companies from entering the market at a time when more capacity is needed. And WTO members should commit to remove all unnecessary tariff costs from health supply chains. The members of the Ottawa group, including the UK and the Netherlands, are working through the EU uh, and have proposed new talks to this uh, end at the WTO. And I think this is a great first step. And I urge you to ensure that any agreement cover the full range of medicines and biologics and also the necessary raw materials, consumables and equipment for their R&D and manufacture. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Oshman. Mr. Koch, um, well, I heard the Netherlands mentioned in uh, Mr. Oshman's remarks there. Uh, first of all, could you speak to the wisdom of the European Union's directive on notification of vaccine exports? Is it, could this become actual restrictions on vaccines? Is that good or bad? And what are you doing with your uh, uh, colleagues across the European Union uh, to deal with some of the um, supply issues and tariff issues that you heard Mr. Oshman um, uh, raise? Jesus. Um, well, thank you very much. Yeah, that's uh, you're putting me on the spot there. I was uh, prepared to speak on the reform of the WTO. I'll get back to that as well, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, we, um, we'll we'll do but, that. I'll give. I'll definitely give you um, that chance. But I mean, I, I, it's true that this afternoon the the Commission just announced, of course, the vaccine export authorization mechanism, and uh, the aim is to increase transparency in COVID nineteen vaccine production in the EU and exports and introduce, of course, uh, the authorization approach. It's not an export ban. It's very important that I think we emphasize that. Uh, and it's supposed to apply, of course, to those countries from companies with whom the EU has concluded what they call advanced uh, purchase agreements. But it's time limited only until the end of March. And it contains exemptions, which I think are very important, such as exemptions for humanitarian aid uh, or uh, exemptions for exports that are destined to countries under the COVAX facility. And we'll have to analyze, to be honest, the full uh, extent uh, of this temporary re uh, regulation, the annex at this point. Uh, so I don't have a, a detailed comment I can make, but you'll also recall that the Netherlands and Sweden la uh, last year at the start of the, the COVID-19 crisis, we're already uh, introducing a draft agreement on essential health goods agreements in order to ensure that markets remain open, that we uh, that we work, we produce, and we secure supply lines uh, around essential goods uh, across the globe, and that we don't fall in the foul in the trappings of uh, protectionist. Uh, policies uh, also when it comes to essential health goods. And I think the debate is fair and square, of course, also on this vaccine in this particular case. We have to, it's a fine line. Um, and I, I would be dishonest not to suggest that in the Netherlands, we're also very keen to ensure that our own population uh, will be inoculated at the right time with the right dosage. Um, that's a political demand, it's a societal demand. However, we should not, we should be mindful of the needs of so many other countries, developing countries, that obviously from a health equity and a public health perspective, do need the same measure of access to vaccines, which is why we've also supported COVAX. And COVAX itself needs more vaccines and it needs significantly more financing. And I think that's a big challenge too. So we all need to invest in production facilities and ensure that supply lines are left open uh, and that we can, we can meet public health goals uh, and, and address the issues uh, that have been uh, triggered by COVID-19. Um, perhaps I could just first uh, make a few points and actually on yes. the original question I was asked to, to speak to, yes. to the, the reform of WTO. And I think if we talk about fixing the international trade system, WTO still plays a central part from our perspective. Um, the WTO has struggled for 25 years. Uh, to update its rule book and, of course, to bridge the divide between the membership. But from our perspective, it's sort of now or never for WTO. Uh, there are three reforms that are significant, tackling current societal challenges, restoring the level playing field, 
uh, and reviving multilateralism. But reviving multilateralism is the enabling factor, as far as I'm concerned. It's the political playing field that needs to help us achieve both a substantive response to societal challenges and level playing field. From a societal perspective, we need to really work uh, on, uh, together to use trade agreements to design ambitious green trade policies and sustainable trade agreements that include issues such as labor rights very forcefully, progress towards the Paris Agreement, and of course, issues of gender equality over and above uh, the substance of trade. And this can be done with other organizations of the UN and ILO, but we need the, the membership to be in agreement uh, around this. Within the EU, France and the Netherlands have proposed a policy around sustainability and trade, and the Paris Accord plays a central role in this regard. Uh, when on level playing field, I, I think I can be brief too. Of course, we are concerned that we are still slow in achieving that sort of elusive goal. Uh, it's very clear to us that, that China and other countries uh, need to sort of ramp up their game when it comes to transparency around state subsidies, um, dealing with issues of forced uh, transfer, uh, the forced transfer of technology, um, and of course, uh, sustainability uh, across the board. Last but not least, the status of a country such as China as a developing country. Um, it, you know, we beg to differ that this is uh, relevant in this day and age and that this is appropriate. So from an EU perspective, and the Netherlands has supported that, we've proposed a phasing out uh, of this particular status issue. Now, last but not least, uh, we consider the EU uh, not only as a value community, but of course, it's also the, uh, the largest internal market. We are a multilateral player and we heavily rely on the WTO to be efficient, transparent and effective. So leadership matters in this regard and we look forward not only to the active return of the United States, but also the appointment of a new director general. Um, I believe it may be a she, so um, a heavy burden is placed on her shoulders, but whomever is uh, confirmed, uh, that person will be up to the challenge and the membership needs to enable and to facilitate the decision making to really have an agenda that looks towards the future. There's too much time lost uh, on issues of e-commerce, the digital economy, around which level playing field plays a role again. So I think we, we, can, we can do a lot. And uh, I'm aware that uh, um, the WTO could also be a, a trendsetter when it comes to the debate on global economic recovery alongside the IMF or the bank, dependent on the mandates and the remit, when we're discussing green, social and digital transitions. So these are the challenges we see before us. And time is of the essence. I'm also uh, appreciative of the opinion piece that was published in Foreign Affairs by Chad Brown of the Peterson Institute. Uh, and and um, Brown argued that fixing the international trade system will be key uh, for the Biden administration to win back trust from its allies. But winning trust and gaining trust, restoring trust is a two-way system. From a Netherlands perspective uh, and an EU perspective, I believe we very much look forward to teaming up with the Biden administration on climate change within a fair international trading system and teaming up also on the shared challenges that we see geopolitically and from a trade uh, from a trade angle. So there will be a new cornerstone, I believe, uh, for renewed transatlantic uh, engagement cooperation and the strong partnership that we've always had with the United States. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Secretary Truss, um, uh, Minister uh, Koch has uh, mentioned some of the challenges with respect to dealing with China as a developing nation and so on. And I know the uh, challenges posed by China has been a common a theme that you have addressed many times. When it comes to WT reform, one of the criticisms of the Trump administration was that because it is a consensus organization, is that it is difficult to make fundamental changes to its rules unless everybody agrees. How should the UK, the United States, other market-based democracies proceed if some of the changes you want, for example, to China's use of subsidies are not acceptable to China? Is there a case for an alternative forum or arrangement, a united front or an alliance of democracies that moves outside the WTO to deal with China-specific issues? 
So I, I very much concur on the issues. And I think some of the behavior by China on areas like forced technology transfer, subsidies by state-owned enterprises, and also IP violations have led to some of the mistrust in the global trading system. And it's in everybody's interest to see the system restored, including China's. Because if there isn't trust, if we have a beggar my neighbor approach of increasing protectionism, that will hurt everybody. So I think part of the challenge is to make sure that we have full engagement of all of those who believe in restoring multilateralism, including uh, the US, including the EU, the UK, Japan and others. And it's very important we the coalition includes developing as well as developed countries. It's important that we work together to get that change. There are also other ways, however, that we can promote free and fair trade through uh, bilateral and plurilateral trade agreements. And I think organizations like CPTPP and the development and increased membership of such organizations also puts pressure on the WTO to reform uh, because there have been significant efforts over a number of years to achieve WTO reform. And uh, even areas like fisheries, where there have been significant negotiations, those negotiations haven't yet concluded. So it does need a strong political push from like-minded allies, but it also needs external pressure as well, I think, to reform. And of course, getting a DG uh, into the job is absolutely vital. But I think the UK can play an important role this year as president of the G7, an organization of democracies to help flesh out what the approach to some of those reforms is, get agreement, work also with developing nations uh, and make progress ahead of the MC12 conference, which we're expecting to see take place in December. Thank you very much. Mr. Oshman, what is the, uh, your perspective on the uh, difficulties posed by China's role in the trading system? Uh, in recent years, the European Union, European uh, companies, including German companies, have begun to share some of the same concerns that American companies have long had with respect to access to the Chinese market, discriminatory practice with respect to government procurement, uh, favorable treatment of state-owned enterprises in their system. What are the concerns that you have with respect to the environment in China? And do you worry about these problems being dealt with in a bilateral fashion as the United States have? If so, what is the preferred mechanism in your view that the Western countries deal with those problems? We've seen in China that the Chinese policies of the past uh, three years, I would say, have, have changed considerably when it comes to life science, biologics, uh, drugs, etc. Uh, uh, et um, interestingly, we've seen that the, uh, that the Chinese government has joined the global bodies on regulatory, uh, regulatory alignment, a very, very strategic issue in the life sciences industry. And we've also seen, surprisingly, a strengthening of IP protection in, uh, in China. Uh, we should not underestimate the strength of the Chinese innovation system. There is a vibrant uh, innovation ecosystem in China. If you look some, in, into some of the hottest technology and science developments, cell therapy, gene therapy, or so, you would see that, that something like... Uh, more than 50% of the experiments uh, worldwide or the clinical trials are conducted in China or by Chinese, uh, or by Chinese uh, companies. Uh, market access has improved to some degree. In the, uh, in the case of uh, pharmaceuticals, this is really about reimbursement on a, na on a national drug list. And there was a, there used to be a very negative uh, a policy, in, well, ne very negative, maybe an overstatement, but a, reluctant, uh, a, a reluctance to accept foreign products while Chinese products would get approved much faster. Uh, that is still an issue, but it has, uh, uh, it, has, uh, it has improved. My personal view is that the Chinese government wants to gain access to the world markets. They, uh, they have nascent or emerging global players within their own country. 
and these glo- and these up up and coming global players want the same rules like UK, Netherlands, or Germany-based companies would like to have. So in our in our field, we're seeing a a, a gradual progress in China in the right direction. I'm not claiming that this is uh, a perfect uh, perfect by any means. Thank you, uh, Mr. Koch. Let me uh, turn to you. Um, recently, the European Union um, uh, struck a an investment agreement with uh, with China, and this was despite a uh, you know a subtle suggestion from Jake Sullivan at the time, the incoming national security advisor for President Biden, that maybe you wait a little bit and try and find a more common approach with the United States to uh, actually deal with. Um, commonly held concerns about uh, investment treatment in China. What is your response to the um, criticism that by going ahead with this deal, the European Union has actually weakened the rest of the world in terms of establishing common rules of the road in China? Well, I mean, trade agreements have to serve a purpose. And I think it's at the moment still one of the most effective instruments that the European Union has in its foreign policy and foreign engagement, uh, if we are honest. So one has to apply these very diligently. Now, this agreement, of course, has been uh, a few years in the make and negotiations. Um, It's no secret that a large number of member states uh, were trying to emphasize that quality was, uh, was more important than speed of conclusion. This is... Uh, uh, It has been concluded just before the end of the year. I can understand and appreciate the American concerns around the haste or the ultimate haste in what is always a multi-year process. Um, And one could argue both ways. Uh, One could have waited until uh, the the formal uh, start of the Biden administration or one could have concluded it now. Uh, The good news is that there will still be a few years before this is finally uh, ratified because the member states and their parliaments have serious questions and comments, but we need to see the final text. One of them is certainly around level playing field, uh, secondly on human rights uh, and due diligence in the chain. And the human rights side is is, is very directly related to the Uyghurs, uh, uh, concerns over slave labor or bonded labor, uh, in, in particularly in the textile industry. Uh, and I am not sure at this point that the European Parliament will easily uh, adopt or agree to this investment agreement. The gains of the agreement, uh, if, it, if, it, if, we can, if we're able to proceed with it, are that it sort of uh, sets right or addresses to some extent the asymmetrical relationship that exists currently between the European Union and China, i.e. Chinese companies, be they state-led or not, can more significantly more freely invest within the European Union, uh, um, engage in, 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 in takeovers. Uh, on the other hand, it's very difficult still for many European companies to access and invest in China and the negative list as such is still in operation. It's reduced in terms of uh, the categories under the list, but it's still there. So there is a leveling out. However, for the Netherlands, um, the the devil will be in the detail uh, and our parliament will also be critical. And from the government side as well, we have expressed the range of concerns I have sort of briefly annotated here, and we expect the agreement to address these. Uh, If not, uh, it will be sort of a rocky ride. In the meantime, we think it's very important that we team up with the Biden administration in order to ensure that allies, European Union and the US, address uh, common issues around uh, trade uh, and sustainability. Uh, I mentioned the climate accord, but also human rights. And with that regard, we also focus very much on due diligence in the value chain. We cannot disconnect those. They're not separate exercises. So it's a first step, and let's see how we reach uh, the finishing line. So just to recap, uh, um, with respect to the view of the Dutch government, I know it's a a caretaker government at the moment, but in your view, is the text as written now unacceptable to the Netherlands? And would you favor a reopening of the text? Um, Well, that's the irony with these things. We haven't seen the full and final text. Um, So when we receive the full and final text, we will read it. We will assess it uh, on its merits. In the meantime, there's ample scope 
to discuss uh, and, and engage with the Biden administration as we hope to and as we will do from a European Union perspective. And as you've seen, the European Union, the, the Commission, has already launched uh, a, a new sort of transatlantic agenda uh, with, a, with, with a wide range of issues around which we want to strengthen the partnership with the US. And I also believe that teaming up on issues of shared concern uh, be that uh, from a geopolitical or geoeconomic perspective where it concerns China, that will be very, very important. And in that sense, um, um, being the government having sort of awaiting elections, it makes no difference to the position we've already held before actually the government stepped, stepped down. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions uh, coming in now and Secretary Truss, I'm going to direct uh, this one to you. Uh, how do we navigate uh, the geopolitical tensions in trade and technology development, such as in 5G, that are hindering multilateralism. And if I might uh, just um, em enhance that question a little bit, we hear the word decoupling a lot lately. And under the Trump administration, there was a very forceful effort to decouple extensive parts of the technology development value chain and, uh, and trade. Uh, the UK faced a lot of pressure and ultimately did exclude Huawei uh, from its 5G networks. What happens next? Is there further to go on this? Do you think we went, we went too far? And what mechanisms should exist to govern the so-called decoupling dynamic? I think what we've all discovered during the COVID crisis is the vital importance of transparency around our supply chains and understanding where critical goods come from and you know, I'm not in favour of autarky. I'm in favour of uh, using trade to diversify our supplies and make sure that our economies are resilient. And one of the reasons that the UK is negotiating a series of bilateral trade deals, including with the United States, New Zealand and Australia, as well as our proposed accession to the CPTPP, is we want to work with like-minded allies first of all, to help set standards, particularly in areas like digital, uh, where there's an important international debate, but also to be able to diversify our supply chains amongst like-minded countries. And I think that is a uh, very important strategic approach that we are taking and others are taking too. Um, you mentioned technology. I think quite often trade gets the blame for technological development in terms of the impact it has on industry, the impact it has on working people. But I think we've also got to be very careful in our trade policy that we are making sure that everybody feels the benefits. And one of the focuses of UK trade policy is to make sure that the whole United Kingdom benefits from trade deals we do, and that those uh, benefits and costs are fully assessed uh, in all the work we undertake. But it, our approach is working with like-minded partners to help set standards and to use that uh, process to help shape uh, the global trading system. And what we can't end up doing is allowing vendors who are artificially subsidizing particular products to be able to undermine the proper working of free markets based in democratic nations. That's a really important principle. Uh, if I could just follow up for one second, I believe the, uh, the, the, the UK government has actually talked about perhaps exploring the use of government mechanisms to basically nurture some of these frontier industries in the UK. Do you see a need for subsidy codes and the uh, treatment of so-called industrial policy to be modernized so that it would permit uh, efforts by governments such as your own to localize or to, to to generate more of that production at home to help some of those people who, as you say, have felt left out from globalization in the past? As I said earlier, you know, we are very committed to tougher action on subsidies at the WTO and making sure that we are operating not just within WTO rules, but we are upgrading those rules to, fit, to deal with the kind of subsidies, the unfair subsidies that we've seen operating in that global market. I think key to this is making sure we're transparent. So what, what support is being given? Why is it being given? And not reverting to the sort of 
1970s approach, which uh, was prevalent in Britain of supporting industries that don't uh, don't have a uh, effective future. But the UK will shortly be bringing out details of our uh, new industrial strategy, which will uh, outline further further aspects. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Oshman, a question, I'm going to direct this question to you from the audience. Thinking about fair trade and distribution, um, how are vaccine supplier countries such as your own monitoring transparency in the value chain from start to finish to ensure that the uh, recipient countries are fully confident of the quality and, and, and so on of the vaccines they're receiving? As you know, vaccine resistance is a significant problem facing the world as they attempt to basically get control of and suppress this pandemic? First of all, I would say it's almost a miracle that uh, less than a year after this pandemic started, that we have several vaccines that are effective and safe, that can be used, uh, that can be used widely in all sorts of populations. The technical questions of efficacy, safety, and quality are being managed by the competent regulatory authorities. In the United States, that would be the FDA. Uh, in, in the European Union, it's the, the uh, European Medicines Agency. In the, in the UK, it's the MHRA. Uh, these are very well-established, well-functioning uh, um, uh, bodies and, uh, and processes. And the cooperation between the regulatory bodies and the researchers and uh, companies who, uh, who have developed the vaccines have uh, reached a level that was unprecedented. There's often in these regulatory processes, there's a lot of red tape. Uh, in this case, it was, uh, it was really, uh, really very different. So uh, uh, quality issues, I don't, uh, uh, I don't see any uh, any topic with re, uh, with regard to that, you know, vaccine development is a very uh, a very risky thing uh, in terms of scientific risk, biological risk. We've just seen uh, last uh, last week that a large U.S. company has stopped their COVID vaccine development. We've seen that uh, uh, today that uh, another large U.S. company has published uh, efficacy data that are let me say so so as far as I can as far uh, as far as I I can tell the issue with vaccines is right now is availability and it's equitable access uh, to these vaccines. Uh, the two ministers on the call have referred to COVAX and other, other uh, uh, platforms that exist to, uh, and that are working on that. And I see tremendous progress. I actually, in contrast to what is generally being discussed in the media, I've seen more uh, global cooperation in this whole vaccines area than uh, uh, than ever before. There will be uh, there will be issues. There's some technical issues. Some vaccines need to be stored at very low temperatures. That might change in uh, in due course. Uh, we uh, we don't uh, we don't know yet. But even for developing nations, you know, at the prices, uh, uh, the cost of these vaccines, um, the GDP loss. Uh, that uh, that we're seeing through uh, through the pandemic is so huge that the cost of vaccines is actually a comparat uh, a comparatively uh, comparatively minor. Uh, we are right now we're seeing shortages. Uh, I was uh, I was alluding to that in my entry uh, in my entry statement. Um, but you know you go back a couple of weeks we had no idea whether we would have vaccines so we cannot expect miracles. I, uh, currently, I see that uh, uh, many global players are cooperating on manufacturing in quite a few different countries. And I, I expect that we will see within the next couple of months, we will see uh, a tremendous progress on availability, on the availability of vaccines. We need to be, we need to be realistic. We cannot cut corners. Uh, uh, as you said, quality is, uh, quality is very important. Vaccine manufacturing is super complex. We need to protect. We need to protect patients, and we shouldn't make any compromise on on quality. But all in all, I think we've made amazing progress in this. Thank you, uh, Minister Koch. I'm going to uh, direct this question to you. Uh, one of the principal sources of the backlash against 
multilateralism and globalization of recent years is the perception and the experience that trade agreements and international trade have delivered enormous benefits for the totality of society while creating very serious costs and uh, social damages to communities and regions. How do we reform multilateralism so that we actually do not leave behind uh, specific communities and so forth and therefore rebuild support for the international trading system? Yeah, um, well, I think the, the backlash against international trade agreement, of course, stems from a backlash against globalization. Uh, and I very much agree with uh, with uh, Secretary Trust that we're not looking to rebuild autarky. What we can do, however, is to strengthen uh, content uh, and the quality of trade agreements um, where sustainability is key, uh, addressing the impact of climate change, uh, ensuring and guaranteeing labor rights and building around value in the supply chain. But that requires a collective effort and all multilateral international organizations need to assist in this regard. But ultimately it's the design phase uh, in the negotiations that sets uh, the stage for quality agreements. The redistribution of wealth uh, and of course uh, the, the drive to achieve equity requires more than only trade agreements. Trade is, is meant to create jobs, hopefully sustainable and green jobs. Um, and we need to of course make sure that standards are met and that compliance is ensured. And that's been a, the weak point, I believe, that it's been between states and that um, follow-up compliance and uh, redress for communities affected or impacted, redress when your rights uh, have been uh, have been hit or uh, have not been met. Uh, that's been an important point in, in many trade agreements. The European Commission has established uh, a dispute settlement uh, channel in that regard, but I believe we can do better looking to the future of uh, new trade agreements, we need to look at sustainability and the Paris Accord. But redistribution of wealth, the issue of equ equity, we also need to work, of course, with the IMF um, bilaterally and multilaterally with all partners to ensure we set the right agenda. Uh, so the criticism, I think, to some extent is fair, but it's a, it's a, a, a case of collective responsibility and action. And in the 21st century, we certainly don't, do not have time to waste. Um, and uh, yeah, national planning, uh, national economic planning, uh, and, and, and obviously democratic processes are equally important. Trade is not the panacea for all evils. It's an enabler and it can be an accelerator, but one cannot put everything on a trade agenda. Thanks. We only have just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to just ask a quick question to both of the trade ministers uh, in this call. Uh, when do you expect to meet, uh, when, you, when you have your first meeting with your counterpart from the new Biden administration, what is, will be the top of your priority list? I'll start with you, uh, uh, Secretary Truss. Well, the top of my priority list is, first of all, de-escalating some of the immediate trade tensions. So, for example, the steel dispute, the Airbus Boeing dispute. We shouldn't be in a position where the UK, the EU and the US have tariffs on each other. We need to work together and we also need to restore the multilateral trading system and restore the WTO. And Minister Koch? I completely uh, agree with that. Um, for, for us, um, we need to have a, an, an assertive, uh, relevant European Union in this world. And when it comes to the US, definitely, I hope that both sides can agree to uh, take all the distorting measures off the table. They should never have been there. Uh, it's a new era, new dawn, new era with President Biden and his team. Uh, and we need to uh, to team up together to, meet, uh, to address the challenges and all these uh, uh, reciprocal measures against uh, trusted partners are not part of this, uh, this platform as far as I'm concerned. So I hope the sooner we can move on the steel measures, uh, on, other, uh, on other measures that were taken, uh, trade imbalances, it's not part of uh, the new dialogue. Well, I'd like to thank everybody on this panel. We're now uh, out of time. It's been an extremely interesting discussion. We stand at a very important hinge point in the future of the international trade system. And I look forward to continuing this dialogue with you and others in the, in the coming months. I'd also like to thank all the people who joined this call and the World Economic Forum.